Hi, or is this just us? Just us. Awesome. Let's do it. All right, here we go. Hi, everyone. We're going to give it a few seconds to let everyone flow in, and then we'll begin. Don't mind the silence. Hello and welcome to our Accounting for CEOs four-part webinar series. Today's webinar is brought to you by the SBDC at UCI Beale Applied Innovation in partnership with TGG Accounting. The SBDC is funded in part by the U.S. Small Business Administration and the state of California. The SBDC is here to help you start, grow, and succeed in your business by providing no-cost expert consulting and training such as this webinar. In addition to our regular consulting on business management and equity funding, we also have been helping our small business clients understand and apply for SBA loans such as EIDL and PPP. We also advise on how to administer these loans if you receive them. If you need any assistance, please call our number at 1-800-616-7232. If you're a tech or life science business, you can go straight to our intake form at sbdctech.org slash contact. All this information will be put into the chat. A little housekeeping before we begin. Everyone is muted during the webinar. Tomorrow, the recorded webinar and a PDF copy of the slides will be sent out to all participants. There will be Q&A at the end of the presentation, but please free, feel free to ask questions during the webinar by clicking on the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. We may not get to everyone's questions, but we will do our best. Our program today will be presented by Joe Johnston, Senior Accounting Manager at TGG Accounting, as well as the Director of Business Development for the LAOC region. During his time at TGG, Joe has supported businesses from the startup size through middle market growth and transactions. Joe, over to you. Thank you so much for presenting today. Oh, no problem, Hannah. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, quick quick follow-up plug for, for SBDC. Uh, before I even get started here, I just have to say with my time at SBDC, I've never seen such a greater source of just consistent, valuable content from legal, from accounting, from finance. Uh, and everyone here together, everyone here today in attendance, I hope that you sign up for uh, communication and register for, for more emails from SBDC. Uh, well, team, uh, thank you so much for joining us and thank you again, Hannah. I'm very excited uh, to be presenting for you here today, the third in our four part series of accounting for CEOs, today focusing on a really fun industry, uh, which is going to be manufacturing. So today we're gonna have a lot of fun chatting through what you can do as a CEO to understand your accounting department and help run your business a little bit better by the numbers. So uh, a little bit of background information. This is what I looked like pre-COVID when they were still getting haircuts. Um, but as Hannah said, I am a senior accounting and business development manager with TGG Accounting. Um, to give you an idea of what our firm does, uh, TGG Accounting, we've been around for about 15 years. We don't do any audit work, any tax work. Everything that we do is uh, outsourced financial and managerial accounting to help business owners, executives, and managers run their businesses by the numbers and uh, get more control over their accounting departments internally. Now, so some key takeaways from today so that we can set the table a little while here. Uh, we're going to start out by talking about some characteristics of the manufacturing industry from an, from an accounting perspective. What makes it unique for us? What are some things we should be taking in mind? as we're doing the accounting for our manufacturing business. We're going to talk about the TGG Way basic business model in combination with the price value matrix, which is going to be helping us benchmark our manufacturing business against others in the industry. Now, this is going to be incredibly useful for us so that we can figure out where our business lives in terms of being high value, high cost, low value, low cost, and figuring out how our cost structures uh, should be edited based on that. Finally, we're going to be ending here uh, talking through what are some unique characteristics that you should be working to build into your financials to run your business well, and also some KPIs uh, and some CFO thought leadership here so that we can run some metrics off of those financials once they're built and really help you drive some, uh, some new valuable information on our manufacturing business. So really excited to talk to you guys about this here today. So as we've done in the past, we're going to start here really, really ground level uh, but all of these are going to develop into more accounting based topics for us. So let's start this off really simple. Characteristics of manufacturing for us. We're going to be making something, assembling something, producing something from raw materials, 
or having someone else contract to do that for us. We're working to sell it for more than it costs us to make for a gross profit. And then what's going to separate us here from the retail side is we're trying to find ways so that we can make our processes more efficient and more effective so that we can get a great contribution margin and scale our business to sell far more inventory and can grow our profits. Now, to take a look at this, the manufacturing industry here today in the 21st century, uh, you know, if we looked at manufacturing, you know, 150 years ago, right, we'd be talking about the, the John D. Rockefellers, uh, we'd be talking about our, our oil tycoons and our steel kite tycoons, where every manufacturing business to a large degree was really vertically, fully vertically integrated, meaning that business owners came up with a formula, they hired scientists, they sourced raw materials, they went through all the laborious manufacturing processes, and their goods were produced here and distributed from here. Now, that is, there are still businesses that are like that, certainly in the US, but now as our global approach has expanded, and we have more accessibility to different logistical supply chains, we can start to utilize other options. So let's start breaking apart the manufacturing industry. First, on our far left, we have true vertical manufacturing. This is still something historical, right? Where we own our IP, we've created our product, and we're going through all of the manufacturing steps ourselves. Uh, an example of whom you'll hear me use quite a bit today is Taylor Guitars, which is a uh, acoustic guitar manufacturer based out of my hometown, San Diego, um, that goes through all the processes of cutting down trees, getting them shaped into the right places for to be, become guitars, and go all the way through distribution processes. Now, over here on your far right, you'll have what's become quite a bit more common in the 20th century and the 21st century, which is utilizing contracted manufacturing organizations. That's so to say that uh, if you have a startup where you have incredible IP and you want to get a product manufactured and produced, you're going to, you may not actually have it manufactured here because you don't want to put in the upfront, upfront investment to get a facility, to get machines, to get raw materials. So you find someone that already has all those things built and set up and utilize them as a service to actually manufacture your product, right? This is exceptionally common in sports nutrition industry where you, know, you have uh, factories and, and uh, facilities in, in China and the Far East where they already have uh, FDA approved facilities that can produce the chemical components that you need to make protein shakes, et cetera. Uh, so exceptionally common now. And then third, kind of a, a tangent associated business is becoming that manufacturing service organization. So if we think about, for instance, Hasbro, right? The, uh, the childhood toy company, the company that makes Monopoly, Sari, Civil War, this company, uh, at this point, actually doesn't do much of its own manufacturing at all anymore. It utilizes, uh, it utilizes an offshore resource that it contracts with to produce all the manufactured goods. Now, this company is effectively providing this as a service. It doesn't own any of the IP, and it just needs to make sure that it's making a profit on the contracts for its production. So that's what manufacturing looks like today. So let's, let's piece these apart and take a look at what these might be for us. So taking a look at our true vertical manufacturing, starting very general here. In this type of an industry, we're going to be accepting higher levels of risk and also higher le levels of operational involvement. What I mean by that is we're putting forth all of our initial investment to say, let's create the facility, let's create the structure, let's create the processes so that we can actually go get our raw materials, put them in the correct, uh, in the correct formats and the correct quality that we want so we can produce our product. So it's higher risk because we have to invest into having that equipment versus contracting it out and shopping for a facility that can produce those for us. But at the same time, we also have more leverage if we could put a greater microscope on our own internal processes and our own operations to find efficiencies where we can improve profitability. So higher risk, but also a lot higher reward potential. Now, in this industry, a lot, of our, a lot of our success is going to be dependent on fixed cost coverage to make sure that, we can, that we're making a profit on individual units sold and covering our overhead. That we're utilizing what's going to be called standard costing that we're going to get into here in a little bit. And that you're using standard costing to perform manufacturing variance analysis to understand 
when is it taking too long for me to, to produce something? Does it take more or less machine hours? And how much is it, how much do my raw materials cost today versus which they cost, what they cost yesterday? So all of these are gonna be really success metrics for us in a true vertical manufacturing environment. In a contracted manufacturing organization, so again, for the example of sports nutrition where you own the IP, but you're having someone else in either uh, onshore or offshore producing your product for you, are, we're going to have different concerns and different focuses here. We're gonna to have to take a look at finding a quality manufacturer that we feel comfortable with, that we're reviewing quality and reviewing their standards and their logistics. We're gonna have quite a bit lower fixed costs because all of these are gonna be pushed through to the manufacturer level. But something recently that's, that's come up, uh, certainly in the last 20, 30 years, there are concerns surrounding IP protection. Now, this isn't a political commentary, but it has been raised that uh, certain manufacturers that are contracting out to uh, particularly say medical or surgical implant or technology manufacturers that are outsourcing their manufacturing overseas may see that their IP is taken and created into a generic copy uh, by that company. So these are legitimate concerns that have been brought up in the past. Now in this environment, quite a bit more we're focusing on logistics and distribution. Are we forward looking enough in our purchase orders and do we understand our production lead time as it relates to our manufacturer to get our product here where we need it to be? Now let's take a look at our manufacturing service organization. Now this is if you are the manufacturer and you don't own any of the IP, we're really providing our manufacturing services, our machine shop as for example, as a service to other businesses with IP to produce their product. In this case, of course, we're holding all of the fixed costs related to, related to the facility. And, but we do have quite a bit more potential to diversify our customer base, so long as what we're producing is a generic potential product, right? So to say that the company that's producing sports nutrition for one company could produce it for 100 companies with different branding, slight differences in, in chemical formula, and utilizing the same manufacturing components here. So it leaves you a little bit more protection as it relates to your sales force. Now, success in this environment is going to be bridged based on efficiency and quality in production to ensure that we can maintain quality, we can maintain customers, and that we can lower the cost that it takes us to produce our bid based on the service contract. That we can maintain good production contracts to keep our, to keep our sales funnel full. And of course, that because we're front loading so much of the cost to actually produce our products, that we're taking deposits and we're understanding our financing and cash life cycle based on when we're going to be getting paid from our customer, from who's providing us our contract, and from when we're actually need to go out and source raw materials. Understanding these are gonna be critical to ensure that the lights don't go out in our facility halfway through production. So now that we've taken a look at those, let's, let's take a look at two, two interesting characteristics in our manufacturing business. There are really two different, two different potentials for the way that our business is positioned. We could either be a business that is in a position to sell everything that we have, right? Uh, particularly in the startup phase, if you have a great product, if we have a manufacturing facility and we can produce a product that that we can sell every single thing that we can make, then really we're in a position where what we're facing is production limitations. We need to take a look at, at what point do we wanna finance our ability to produce more inventory, find an equity partner that can pump in cash to help us finance more production of inventory and to make sure that we're really making money on those sales. Because at the end of the day, if you have a great product that sells and it's profitable, you can always find financing or find a great equity partner that'll help contribute towards your business and increase the production to match the sales and the demand. The other side is of course looking at sales and distribution limitations. If we can't sell everything that we produce, we're going to be taking a different approach to taking a look at how much production do we actually want to maintain. We don't want to just make all the inventory that we can and push all of our cost, all of our cash into inventory that's gonna end up sitting on our shelves for quite a longer than it's gonna to take to turn. 
because that's cash that we can use elsewhere. So from that position, we really want to take a look at our sales funnel. What do we think we're going to be able to sell and back into production, back into your raw materials purchases, your labor hiring, and more. Now, let's get into a really juicy accounting topic here. And I'm going to do my best to gear this right towards our CEO and our executive group on the non-accounting side. And this is a manufacturing accounting concept called standard costing. This is a great basis to review our operations. Now, let's, let's break this down a bit here and what standard costing really means. So if we're producing a product, what we want to take a look at are what are the average average items and inputs that it takes to produce those things. What's the standard that we want to set to say this is normal, this is average for a product. We're going to take a look at how many hours of labor does it produce, how many hours of raw, how many, how much material does it take to produce at this average cost, and what amount of machine hours does it take if we're using specialized machinery. As long as you're, if you're not making birdhouses, you probably have some level of machinery that's going to go into producing this. When we put all of these things together and we put together our other standard variable overhead costs, such as it takes this amount of extra utilities to power this heavy machinery, right? Um, all of these standard costs, the, the standard inputs that it's going to take to make one unit are to become our standard cost to evaluate the performance of the whole manufacturing operation on a continuous basis. So let's figure out how we're actually going to do that. For example, when we take a look at labor costs, once we understand that it takes one hour or two hours to produce a product, and we see that our labor costs, our direct labor that went into producing the number of projects is over or under, this means one of two things. We could either have what's called a labor efficiency variance, which means that our people are taking longer to produce a product, or it's maybe it's more complicated, it takes longer than we thought, or we have a labor price variance to say, Maybe we, had to, maybe we had to hire specialized labor to actually produce our product. Or maybe we, maybe we were able to save on labor. But thinking about these two items together, putting these two items together, we have a total labor, labor variance. And let's think about what that could mean conceptually. It makes quite a bit of sense. If we think that maybe we saved quite a bit of money by hiring someone who's less experienced, but it took them twice as long to produce the product, really, we're saving here, but we're losing here and we actually might end up right back in the middle. So breaking down your variances and operations and cost based on your standards uh, can really help you understand what's happening in the manufacturing process. From a material standpoint, we could take the same look. We could look at our overall materials variance, which we're gonna break down to a purchase price variance. So to say, it took me more, I, I had to pay more per, per foot of wood. To, to make my guitars, or I had to pay more per ounce, per gram, per pound of my, pro of my raw material to produce my product, which is affecting my purchase price variance. And then we also take a look at materials quality variance. How much spoilage, how much breakage did we have? How many, you know, did it, was I able to use that same one foot of wood to produce a six inch roller, right? Or did it, did it snap in half and I ended up having to use two? right based on the quality of materials these two things together are going to become our materials variances so now we're starting to build quite a bit of visibility into our operations that we can do this from an accounting standpoint once you develop your standard cost uh, taking this one last step further uh, we can do the same thing for as it relates to machining hours looking at our machine efficiency uh, how much repairs and maintenance do we expect it to take did it take, is it a machine that takes gasoline, that takes utilities? Um, or how, how is that compared to our standard, what we expected it to take? And that way we can figure out our machines, is it a more difficult product to produce from a machining standpoint? Or maybe are our machines starting to, starting to deteriorate and decline? So really we can get more visibility into our facilities as well. So a lot of power as it comes to standard costing. Now let's take a look at what's called the TGG Way Basic Business Model and the Price Value Matrix. Now this is something that we've touched on in all of our various uh, trainings so far. So we're going to start out with a general conversation on it to make sure we're all on the same page. And then we're going to move on to, the, to getting this very specific to the manufacturing space. So the TGG Way Basic Business Model 
was created by our CEO and president over the course of the past 15 years because we've had companies come to us to ask us, you know, I, I want to figure out how I should really be spending my attention on the accounting side, on the financial performance side. Um, and I'm trying to compare myself to competitors, but, you know, I'm a $5 million company, they're a $7 million company, uh, or they're a $25 million company. Is it really comparable, right? Or maybe we're both manufacturing, but one produces guitars, and one produces surgical implants, right? Are they comparable? Well, using the basic business model, we don't have to be exactly the same business or the same or even the same product to compare our businesses. And this is something exceptionally simple. We could do it in these five lines to figure out what our business looks like. So starting out with the basic business model, what you're going to do is take your top line revenue in your business, and that's going to be 100%. Everything else that we look at is taking a look at it as a percentage of revenue. So for instance, here, taking a look at our next line, our cost of goods sold, we're going to be putting that in. That's the, all of the, co the input costs related to producing your product, all of your raw materials that are placed in, all of your, um, all the labor hours, the machine hours, all of those direct costs that are going to end up on a product that we're, selling, that we're sending out. The costs that were necessary to produce that product are our cost of goods sold. Taking that as a percentage of our revenue, we're coming in at a 50% gross profit. How much we make off of each, each piece of product sold. Now, if, it, if you have costs that don't end up on your product, that aren't necessary to produce your product, all of these costs are called your SG&A. That's your selling, your general, and your administrative expenses. So you're you paying for your salespeople to go out and sell your surgical implant product to uh, various, uh, various hospitals, or if you're selling guitars, having your people go out to trade shows and uh, paying to have, you know, Billy Joel or whoever you play your guitar. Your general and your administrative is really going to be, think about your accounting department, your administrative staff, the people that are there to keep the wheels turning, to make sure that we have a business in the background that's running, but that, isn't, that aren't really related to producing the product in the end. That's your SG&A. When we take out all these components, we're left with net operating income, which is your take-home profitability. How much does my business make? When we get down to it. So let's see how we're going to take this basic business model to evaluate another company. If we said that this was your basic business model where you're making 50% gross margin and 10% net operating margin, then we could see how your business is performing. But if you compared your business to the basic business model for your industry and said, you know what, my cogs are actually 60% of revenue. Well, that causes your gross profit to be 40%. And now suddenly we can't cover our SG&A. Our net operating income is at break even. We can't run our business this way. In fact, we might even be at a net loss and not be seeing it. This is how we're gonna be using our basic business model. Now, before we take a look at the basic business model for your company, things, there are certain things that are going to shift your position in the basic business model. And that's namely the price value matrix. The price value matrix allows you to figure out, am I a high value, high cost business or a low value, low cost business? So the example that we've been using in the past is Neiman Marcus, high value, high cost, right? In terms of luxury, luxury goods, luxury uh, apparel. And then the low value, low cost option is of course, Walmart, right? Taking a look at convenience, getting $4 shirts, those types of things that are presumably lower quality. Well, as long as you live, in this sphere, being in one of those two positions or somewhere in the middle, then your business can be profitable and your business can succeed. So for instance, swinging this back to the, the guitar environment, if you're on making PRS guitars or high quality Taylor guitars, you're gonna be in the higher price, higher value spectrum. Versus if you're going through you know, Walmart and, and Target and you're seeing the, the little ukulele in the toy section, that's probably lower on the low cost, low value section because they're not trying to be high value. So thinking about this conceptually, this has to make sense, right? We don't have to be at these two extremes, but we need to be somewhere in this line. If we're low value, high price, no one's gonna buy our product. And if we're high value, low price, that means we're spending all of our money producing a great product and we're not selling it for a good price. And we're gonna be out of business pretty darn quick. So 
you could be somewhere in the middle here with, you know, in the guitar spectrum, Fender and Gibson, um, right, in their, in their middle market products. But as long as you're in here, you can be profitable. So let's compare that and keep that in mind as we're taking a look at the manufacturing basic business models. So we have to divide this, you the manufacturing industry, it's really two different segments here. They're gonna hopefully make some sense. So starting out on the left side, we take a look at specialty manufacturing. So specialty manufacturing means that if we're making products that are built to order, they require, you know, it's maybe it's in a niche market. It's very custom to a specific buyer. Uh, it's machined, it takes specific IP and consulting and blueprints and technical specifications. That is gonna be a higher quality product, right? It takes more input for that reason we're able to make a higher markup on it because not any facility could make that special product. So in this scenario, we're getting higher revenue and we have a lower cost of goods sold relatively because we still have our traditional manufacturing costs, but we're able to charge more because it's a higher quality product and specific product. On the other end though, when we take a look at our SG&A, you'll notice that our, our sales general administrative costs are quite a bit higher because now what we need to do is for our bill to order product, we need to go out and sell it and market it because now it's more niche positioning. We need to make sure that we have sales organizations that are going to the hospitals to make sure our surgical implants out there that are, are as, to use the same example again, that our guitar, our uh, salespeople are going out and selling our guitar at uh, NAM and trade shows uh, and that we're really getting front and present uh, in terms of our marketing to keep in that high value positioning that we're taking as a specialty manufacturer. Now, on the other end of the spectrum, if you're in generic manufacturing, you could still have a very great product. That doesn't mean you have a poor product, but if you're in the generic manufacturing space, this means that everything that you make is really the same. I'm producing 5,000 of the exact same guitar, I'm producing 5,000 of the exact same widget, whatever it is, and we're pushing that, making that available to the market, right? This is a different position because now maybe there's other pieces, other competitors out there that are comparable for you. For that reason, uh, and because it didn't require special custom IP or excuse me, special custom uh, blueprinting and machining for a certain customer, we can't charge quite as much. So we accept a lower gross margin on our sales. But at the same time, because it's more of, more of an available product, we don't need to push ourselves quite as much as it relates to our selling general administrative costs. We don't need to go have, you know, uh, Billy Idol go play our guitar because we know that it's widely available and it's on every shelf and guitar center, right? So two very different positionings here, but uh, these are also ones that are on a spectrum. If you find yourself in a position where, you know, I'm, I'm in a niche, I'm in a niche market, but at the same time, it is one product. It's not custom built, it's not custom manufactured. Then really you might be in a blended position. You might be somewhere in between here, so to say, right? Uh, for instance, I, I've worked with a business that did surgical implant manufacturing and they made screws for, um, uh, screws for spine surgery. And it's the same screw as long as you're within, uh, you know, a foot and a half of a certain height, right? And then the only ones that are different are if you're over seven foot or if you're under, you know, four foot or something like that. So in these cases, you have still have a high quality product that might be in, still in a niche and it's not quite as generic. So you could be in a blended position here. So keep that in mind and also keep in mind your positioning relative to others in the market. Are you positioning yourself? If there, if there are other people in your manufacturing market, am I on the high value, high price spectrum? or mind the low value, low cost spectrum. So two things to consider together. Now, with that in mind, let's take a look at some unique factors as it relates to the manufacturing industry financials. These are what your, some different approaches that you could take advantage of when preparing the financial statements for your manufacturing business. First here, uh, something that we also brought up in our retail presentation is the use of a contribution margin approach that's going to be separating out what are your variable costs from your fixed costs. Now, this allows us to understand our variable and our fixed cost coverage. Variable costs only occur when a sale happens. 
right? So to say that I only need raw materials when I'm making a product that I'm gonna sell. I only need to have my manufacturing guys or gals make my product when I have the product to sell, right? Versus I have rents that are really part of my, my facility, my structure, and I need that all the time. These things are gonna become part of our fixed costs on our administrative labor. So separating these out can really help us get a different understanding of what's called our contribution margin, which is our variable cost coverage, so that we can figure out, are, do we have a product that's profitable on its own? And how much of it do we need to sell potentially to cover those fixed costs? So on your left here, you'll see what is a traditional income statement. Same as our basic business model, revenue, cost of goods sold, gross profit, sg and net operating income. And on the right side, what you're really seeing is broken out here in the contribution margin style statement is our variable COGS and our variable sg and from the fixed components of those. So let's take this a step further and let's take what is quite a bit of accounting on this tab and figure out what that really translates to for us, right? Let's, let's simplify this a little bit. Now, if you are in a business that has a positive contribution margin and a positive gross margin, let's think about what that means. That means from a contribution margin standpoint, every single product I sell covers my variable costs, meaning that my sales price is greater than maybe my labor and my raw materials. So from a very basic standpoint, I can cover my costs there. And from a positive gross margin standpoint, I really know that all of my costs and my cost of goods sold are gonna be covered uh, for my business. But, so that would be a best case scenario. If we have a positive contribution margin and a negative gross margin, ooh, now we're in an interesting position. This is where most manufacturing businesses live or most manufacturing businesses could deal with at some point. What this really means is that we still have a product where when we manufacture it, we're able to cover our variable costs. We, we make, we are able to sell it for more than the cost of our materials and the cost of our labor. But maybe I didn't sell enough really to cover my fixed cost components. I didn't sell enough um, to cover my, my rents, to cover my, uh, my variable overhead that really is gonna become a component here. So we need to increase our production capacity and make sure we're increasing the volume of our sales. If we're in a position where we have a negative contribution margin and a negative gross margin, then really every extra product that we sell, we cannot make it up in volume. That means that we are not selling our product for enough to cover even our basic direct input costs, our raw materials or our labor going into our business in the most simplified sense. Uh, so in this case, really you can't make it up in volume, you're just digging the hole quite a bit deeper. This is really important to understand as we're working with business owners here. So let's take a look here. When we, when we talked about uh, standard cost analysis, standard costing is something that you can implement into your income statement um, to it'll expand out your income statement a bit. It's a bit more of an advanced accounting topic, but if you have a manufacturing business and you're bringing everything in-house, it's really worthwhile to build out a standard cost procedure and utilize an accounting team to do this. So in this case, in your cost to get sold, breaking that down a bit further, what you're going to see is your direct labor at standard. So to say that here's how much direct labor cost should have been based on my estimates of it taking one hour to produce one each widget at a cost of $10 an hour and for that many units. Now, if we have a variance or direct labor variance, uh, this is going to either increase or decrease our cost to get sold. So to say that in this case, our direct labor variance is unfavorable, meaning that our cost of our labor was higher than we expected. And we could start taking a look at what happened in our operations for that to be the case. Is it a labor component where maybe we need to get people more training? Is it a harder product to produce? Or what's really going on? At the same time, here's our materials variance in action. So same idea, here's our materials at standard, how much it takes to produce all of our, all of our products that we produce. Right, maybe it's one dollar of raw materials for uh, every unit. We sell twenty-five thousand units, and in this case, we have a four thousand dollar favorable variance. So, in this case, the favorable variance is really telling us that it took less materials than we thought to produce. 
or it took less cost of materials to produce because we got them cheaper, we got them at a great discount. So all these together are gonna to take what are gonna be your true cost of goods sold at the end of the day. And this analysis is so important for a vertically integrated manufacturing business. So um, here in this case, as we already discussed, I won't hammer this again, but um, as we talk about direct labor variance, direct labor variance is talking about your direct labor price times your direct labor quantity. So just as we're taking a look at any of these variances, you always think price times quantity. One of these two things is the shifted factor that's, a, that's going to be deviating from my standard. Now so let's take a look at the balance sheet. The balance sheet for a manufacturing business is going to look relatively ordinary, except for inventory, of course. Now, when we take, talk about inventory and manufacturing space, this is, of course, the most critical, one of the most critical components of our financials. Not counting your inventory, not reviewing and reconciling your inventory, it's not like not reconciling your cash and not counting your cash. It's seriously that big of a deal. So as we're taking a look at our inventory, uh, often what we recommend is, is tracking your inventory through production cycles, so to say, it's particularly if you're vertically integrated. So to say, let's track our raw materials input that we have, let's track products that are going through our production cycles, that have entered production cycles, and then let's separate out finished goods available for sale. In this case, we can start to track what is our lead time it takes to actually produce goods, and at what point in time are we going to have a, are we going to have a potential lull between things at the front end of the production cycle and not enough in finished goods that we can't fulfill on sales in a short time. So tracking these items separately are gonna help you figure out that all of your production cycles are fully utilized correctly. Uh, again, another, another inventory option that we see uh, often in the small business space, particularly in the medical space um, or, or the apparel space here, uh, if you're on the manufacturing side, is gonna be inventory on consignment. So if you have inventory that you're holding out as available uh, for your seller to use, then that may still be your inventory product, but we wanna separate that out for inventory that's available to transact to other customers. Make sure that we're reconciling that regularly. Um, and as it relates to inventory, something that we discussed last week that still holds true uh, in the manufacturing space is that how critically important it is to understand when you're when you are appropriately receiving inventory. And a concept that we work on with business owners is understanding that when you purchase a product, uh, whether it's your raw materials or whether it's uh, you sending it to your customer or it's your, um, your supplier bringing you finished goods um, for fulfillment, we wanna know when the inventory is actually going to be changing hands to get it onto your books correctly. This is going to affect our calculations to figure out how long does it take me to actually churn inventory. And the two different primary types of shipping methods and ownership transfers are what are called FOB destination and FOB shipping point. FOB meaning freight on board. If you're working with your supplier who's manufacturing overseas your product and shipping it to you uh, for you to distribute out to your customers, and they could either be uh, they could either be sending you those products and transferring them to you FOB destination, meaning that as soon as they land here in the United States at your fulfillment warehouse, you've accepted delivery and now inventory title transfers. Or it could be the case that inventory title transfers as soon as it leaves uh, their dock on their side. So this is going to help, this is going to adjust risk and reward in terms of where, who's responsible for inventory at different stages if there's some breakage or shrinkage during uh, transference, and at the same time taking a look at how long our inventory is actually available in stages. Uh, and as we mentioned, this is particularly important in dropship manufacturing environment, where someone else is manufacturing the good, and but we hold IP to it, and we're really focusing on distribution model. Uh, this is a visualization of what those two look like. So in this case, the seller manufacturing your product overseas. Um, in an FOB destination standpoint, it's gonna hold ownership until it arrives at the destination. And in the second example here, as soon as the seller and manufacturer ships the goods, puts it on the truck and it leaves the dock, 
uh, you are taking full ownership and custody of uh, the rights and risks and rewards of that inventory. So, take a coffee break here for a second, and we're going to move on to taking a look at key performance indicators. <sighs> Here are some key performance indicators that we're going to be talking through, items that you want to at least understand to decide which of these are going to be applicable for your business and going to be the most useful for you based on the information you have available. Accounting is constantly a cost-benefit analysis to understand what level of analysis in my accounting do I want to get the benefit of the information it's going to tell me. So as you're doing that, decide which of these KPIs you'd like to be able to work through with yourself. So here are three of my top KPIs uh, that I really love in a manufacturing environment. First is taking a look at our contribution margin per unit. Right? So this is really figuring out, are we making a profitable product on the most basic sense based on our only, only our direct inputs? So that's our taking our revenue per unit less our variable cost per unit. The next year, building this up a little further, is figuring out our break-even point. Ooh. So if we're in a manufacturing space where we know that we're making a positive contribution margin per unit, but we have a fixed cost barrier we need to cover, right, in terms of our, our overheads, our rents, uh, and our different other, our other items here, we want to figure out what's the minimum number of units it's really going to take me just to get down to zero profitability and make sure I'm not taking uh, so the easiest way to do this is to take your total fixed cost and divide it by your contribution margin per unit. This tells us how many units we need to sell to make sure that we're covering our fixed costs. And of course, we can even add to this um, a margin of safety if we'd like. So to say you can take your total fixed costs plus $10,000, right, to make sure that I'm making at least $10,000 uh, on my production cycle every month and how many units it's going to take me to do that. So great for goal setting. And of course, uh, we really hammered this home, so I'm not going to get into it. But the third in my top three is the standard cost analysis that comes from setting your standard costs, looking at materials, labor, overhead, and other efficiencies uh, and effectiveness variances so that you can figure out what's really happening in your operations. Now, um, something from the, from the standard costing side and from the sales poll side, Something that I've found incredibly useful is when we know that we can sell every product that we know that we can sell every single product that we have available that we can manufacture. We can use our standard cost to back into production options, to back into purchases. So in this case, we start out by saying, you know what? Next year, I know that I can sell a thousand guitars, right? I have sales orders, um, or I'm basing this off of you know a percentage increase in demand from the prior year. And now we get into taking a look at, okay, well, what's gonna take me for to actually do that? Well, we have our standards available to us, and so now we don't really have to estimate so much, estimate so much. So we can take a look at, you know, it takes 10 labor hours per unit, right? We're gonna make 10, 1,000 units, that's 10,000 hours. And, you know, I have five people working 2,000 hours a year, right? That's 40 hours a week, 50 weeks. Then now we need five people I can hire, right? But at the same time, we can look at our production standards to say, thousand guitars, I need to have five feet of wood, five feet of direct materials that I'm gonna bend and shape to the guitar. So I really need 5,000 feet of wood at the end of my production cycle. So, and you can start backing out further and further and further and putting in more analysis, going through your production cycle, through your production process to say, okay, well, I know I'm gonna lose a foot of my direct material during production. So I need to get 6,000 feet really. And you can take a look at how much direct materials do we have on hand? how much is available through our supplier. If our supplier doesn't quite have enough um, to produce those amounts, we can figure out what other financing options we want to take to have another producer produce those or adjust upward on how are we going to affect our end production of products. So really exciting stuff we can do using our standard cost and using this analysis really for forecasting your entire business. This is what all the $100 million companies do and going much, much larger. So some other KPIs on the manufacturing side. Uh, here are a few that we discussed last week that are still tried and true uh, in the manufacturing space, days to inventory turn. 
This is taking a look at how long does it take for me to actually sell my product. Um, and we want, to take a, we want to compare that to how fast do I have to pay my supplier to manage cash flow. So this is part of the reason why it's so important to understand that we're bringing on inventory onto our books at the appropriate time. So our days to inventory turn isn't under or overstated. Uh, we also want to take a look at our gross margin ROI, our gross profit over our average inventory every period. So we can figure out how much are we make on our inventory by producing more inventory, by producing less inventory. And if we can do this by inventory types, it's that much more strength and information for us. So uh, to get a little bit more uh, visual here, as our days to inventory turn goes up, this means that it's taken us longer to sell our inventory, our cash is pumped into inventory, we've already pushed all of our cost into it, and now we don't have any revenue. So cash and balance sheet safety is going down while our cash is tied up in inventory and our days in inventory is going up. As our days in inventory go down, we're selling our product faster, I'm turning my inventory investment into cash and sales, my cash and my balance sheet safety goes way up, right? That's how we need to read these. Taking a look at our gross margin return on investment, I have a different approach here. As you're, grow as you're making more um, on your average inventory through your gross margin ROI, we're having better fixed cost coverage and overall better profitability. And the opposite is also true. Now, in the manufacturing space, something that is incredibly important from a cash perspective is understanding your cash conversion cycle. So this helps us understand really how long, how long do I need to float my cash? How much do I need financing, right? From the moment, uh, you, excuse me, your cash conversion cycle is going to include three components that are going to help us break down the different time periods involved in converting cash into cash. So on the front end, we have our days payable outstanding. This means that from the second that I'm buying from my supplier, from my uh, who is ever sending me my raw materials, how long do I have to pay them? So I've already gotten my goods, and maybe I have 30 days, maybe I have 90 days, maybe I have 120 days before I have to pay them for those goods. Okay. During that, I can start going through the production cycle, right? So that's great. So in this case, what we want to look at is adding in our day's inventory outstanding. So our day's inventory outstanding says, okay, now that our product is produced, what's our average inventory and cost to get sold? Um, saying, how long is my product sitting on the shelf before I'm actually able to sell? It? And then adding in addition to this, how, then, how long does it take me to collect on my sales at the end of the day? So with these three items, we can figure out how long is it gonna take me to outlay my cash? All right, when do I have to outlay my cash? And when am I actually going to get a return on my cash investment? In, in any manufacturing environment, as long as you're, if you're either a contracted manufacturer or you're manufacturing and you don't own the IP, or if you're in a position where you're a fully integrated manufacturer, we need to track breakage and spoilage at different points in the manufacturing process. This is again going to help us understand do we have good quality of manufacturing products? Are our machines in good shape? Do our people understand what they're doing um, and really help us figure out our materials at the quality that we want to set based on where we are in the price value matrix and are we losing money on having products that are actually breaking during production. Another piece we're going to, want to look at here is taking a look uh, really at our sales and profitability uh, on DSO by distribution stream. So as a manufacturer, you may be able to approach various different distribution streams, such as if you're selling direct, a direct-to-consumer product, we might be selling e-commerce as well as wholesale through a contract, as well as direct-to-consumer potentially through retail or small retail versus big box. And understanding your profitability at these different levels um, is really going to make a difference. Of course, your, fit, your cost components aren't changing but we want to make sure that our revenue components uh, are, really, uh, are really appropriately covering our costs in different levels here. So to say that you know, we understand that Amazon is going to be taking a percentage uh, out of all of our sales revenue, which is really going to drive it down. So now if we already have a troubled gross margin and a troubled variable uh, contribution margin, maybe that route's not great for us, right? Um, but you have to look at this in terms of your own business and figure out 
what sales price is going to give me a positive contribution margin per unit and open me up to a good volume of customers. Next, taking a look at this here, um, we want to look at our sell-through rate. So to say, what, what amount of our production are we actually able to sell? This may tell us that if we're in a position, uh, if we're in a manufacturing business where it's not a demand pull, right? We're not able to sell everything that we produce. And we're instead in a position where we have to figure out how much we're going to produce based on how much we can sell. This is a metric for you, your sell-through rate. What percentage of my inventory of different types am I actually able to sell through every single month? This is going to help you figure out what products should I continue to produce? What do I need to go out and push sales in a certain area? Are my salespeople not very effective, right? Or are they extremely effective uh, in certain months? So sell-through rate is a great one, particularly when you're in a uh, supply push environment as opposed to a demand pull environment. Now, um, one that I think is also very particularly valuable is understanding breaks between what is called your current ratio and your quick ratio. Now, your current ratio, as we've kind of discussed earlier on in some of our uh, intro topics, is taking a look at how much we can cover our current liabilities, right? Our credit cards, our current bills, our short-term loans, the lines of credit with our current assets. The things that we're gonna be able to turn into cash and we pay off our debts with them, our short-term debts. Well, that's great, but the problem with that is that included in your current assets is inventory. So if, I hate to say it, but if you have debt inventory that you can't sell, you may be in a position where you can't turn that inventory into cash. And we need to figure out what our cash security is even without that. So your quick ratio does just that. It's gonna take your current assets, less your inventory, to figure out what's our cash positioning if something happens and let's say we're in COVID and now suddenly I can't sell any, any of my inventory, right? Before I readjust to e-commerce, can I still cover my bills and my costs? So tracking these two and tracking when they diverge from each other is gonna help us figure out what our cash exposure is and how much cash is locked into inventory. This is my uh, dramatic impression of your inventory shackling you down, by the way. So, gang, I hope you got some great takeaways from today. Um, we've talked a lot about characteristics of the manufacturing space, different types of positions you could take as a manufacturer, uh, basic business model price value matrix, so you can figure out where your business is going to land uh, based on whether you're a built to order manufacturer specialty or you're creating generic products that are available. Uh, by quite a few producers. And taking a look through our KPIs, uh, I hope you found a few that you found to be particularly useful for yourself. So uh, again, we have one last series coming up, which is going to be next Thursday on software. Tell your friends if you have, if you enjoyed the presentation uh, and they're in a software business and interested in joining us, happy to talk about it. And uh, of course, if you have any questions, of course, feel free to connect with me or us on LinkedIn through TTG Accounting. Uh, and send us an email if you like. So with that, gang, I'll open it up to any questions. Thank you, Joe. You got um, it. I'll go, I'll just jump right in. So in most, <laughs> in most of your examples, the COGS for specialty MFG or Neiman Marcus is far cheaper than generic MFG. But in my experience, high quality costs more, not 20% cheaper. So it's not, it's the question so much is not about does it cost more? It will cost more. It costs some amount more. But the difference is that you're able to charge more because what you're doing is you're trying to convey that your product has higher value, right? People are buying the value. They're not buying your gross margin. So the more that you're producing a quality product that, people, that you're saying, mine is different, mine is special, mine makes you look and feel good, and that example of Neiman Marcus, you know, then that's where you're able to sell based on value. So you will see increases of COGS, of course, in terms of you know, higher quality materials, uh, but it's your revenue and your value proposition is going to go up exponentially compared to your cost proposition. Can you explain at what point a startup would want to engage with TGG, time, revenue, market traction, et cetera? Uh, that's, that's a great question. Um, so I would say that uh, startups that we typically work with 
um, that are going to make the most sense for TGG. If you're a startup that is um, funded, that's in revenue, that um, maybe has other private backing where you're looking for accounting support, a sophisticated accounting support, uh, this is something where we can assist. If we're really in some of the earlier stages of the business um, where you know maybe we're, we're pre-revenue, pre-operations, we haven't gotten to Series A, Series B, Series C yet. Um, in these cases, we may be, we're probably a bit premature and you're more appropriate to get um, bookkeeping and accounting support. And we're happy to touch base and, and figure out how we can support you, uh, but we'll most likely be a solution after you get into uh, production or after you get into uh, a little bit more a little bit more funding so that we can work together and, and provide you more sophisticated support. What are sources of information if you and your competitors are private? So great question. I mean, we work with hundreds of, we worked with thousands of businesses over the past 15 years. So we, we work through their financials, right? Uh, in the past three years, I can tell you, even I personally have worked with over 40 businesses, including quite a few that are in all of these different areas of manufacturing. Uh, through our analysis with them and through our analysis of businesses that are private that are public as well, we're able to understand where businesses are performing well. So great question. What is the best way slash system to track inventory? I have a feeling that I'm losing some product to theft. Ooh, great question. So in terms of, your, in terms of tracking inventory, um, I, I'm trying to, I'm not going to give a, a software proposal here, but um, what I'd say is your best source of information on inventory is if you're in a position to have people count it at different stages, then that's going to be your best bet. Physical inventory counts, are a surefire way to understand what you have on site. Uh, there are great inventory systems out there that'll transact inventory through your accounting system. Um, I know that, uh, yeah, I won't, I won't mention any here, but there are quite a few systems that you can use as well. Happy to connect online if you're looking for uh, a different recommendation. Could you explain the difference between overhead and burden are, and what are some typical MFG values are for each? Uh, I'll do my best to do that. So in terms of overhead and burden, right, we're, we're going to have different type, different levels of overhead. So we could have um, our variable overhead, which is going to say that we, we have utilities, right? We have utilities that are related to the administrative side of our business that are ordinary and normal, no matter whether or not we're producing product. And then we also may have components of utilities that are related to, you know, it takes so much more electricity to power our heavy industry machinery, right? That's so you need the special volt, the special watt uh, electricity outlets. So additional costs that it takes uh, into overhead for those types of those types of items to produce your product are going to be on the variable side. Um, types of overhead that are going to be more traditional, right? Are are rents that are not just specific to the facility. Our administrative side are going to be kind of buildings. So uh, again, happy to talk offline about your specific business as well. Can QuickBooks handle the accounting features you mentioned? So QuickBooks can handle QuickBooks can handle quite a bit of this, and you can do quite a bit of this outside of your accounting system as well. So to say that you'll still have um, you'll still have all of your various general ledger accounts for uh, for our maybe our variable overhead, our variable direct direct labor, our variable. Uh, materials and then outside of your accounting system very often what we'll do is we'll end up mapping those to say you know what all of these components are together in our gross margin but we want to pull these three pieces together to say these are really the variable components that we want to build into our contribution margin calculation and these pieces are fixed we want to separate those all right and our last question I think it's more of a comment is sure. I see large companies trying to offer a good, better, best value proposition with their products. But what if you are a smaller company with a niche product? If only offered one version to the customer, you may not realize the sales you may have had if you offered three or four versions at different price points. Yeah, I mean, this is, this is true in, in every industry. This is, this is a great question, great comment, Stephen. So uh, you know, to, to use this, the same example I've been, I've been hammering on here, right? Uh, on the guitar sales, you could have a guitar company like Taylor guitar that's going to make a $400 guitar and then they'll make a $5,000 guitar, right? Good, better, best stages for different levels of accessibility. 
And on the lower end of their spectrum, they're having things that are more on the generic side, right? They're pushing it out to market and anybody can buy it. And then on the higher end of the spectrum, they're having items that are more built to order, you can custom inlays, all the special strings, and things like that. So uh, you can have both of these components inside of your business. If you're, what I would suggest, uh, trying to relate this back to your question is, if you have, are thinking about going that route, if you're thinking about going that route, you need to understand, are you in a demand pull position or supply push position, right? And understand for each of these different situations, how am I covering my, what is my contribution margin going to be? Is it going to take me extra special materials to produce this built to order product? And how is that going to be able to affect my value proposition so I can increase my sales price? How much do I need to sell because now my fixed cost coverage has come quite a bit higher uh, based on that product. So um, all in all, if at the end of the day, the goal is to get to profitability, we want to weigh these, these different things together because you may sell, save yourself, you know, there, you may find great opportunity in selling a specialty product to fewer people, but it may be more of a headache to get custom parts, custom service um, versus being on the other hand where you're in a, you know, a demand pull for a generic, uh, generic product and you can sell it out or without all of the custom pieces, you can get use the exact same equipment, exact same uh, labor, and, and really get your product out there. So at the end of the day, you want to get to profitability uh, and figure out what, what that goal looks like for you as a business owner. How busy do you want to be? All right, Joe, those are all the questions we have. So I just want to thank you again, NTGG Accounting, and everyone who joined us for today's webinar. Um, just a reminder, you will receive the recording and slides tomorrow. And if you'd like to come in for no cost one-on-one -on -one consulting, you can call 800-616-7232 or go to sbdctech.org slash contact. It's also in the chat box. Uh, and we'll see you all next week. Take care, guys.